Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 11 to 34. The book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 11 to 34. Verse 11. So, setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for, for some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia, from the city of Tyathera, a seller of purple goods, who was, a, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by, by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Verse 16, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in, attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows on the, onto, upon them, they threw them into the prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet into the, in the stocks. Verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And they took them, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up to, into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. This is the word of the Lord. And I call upon Pastor to bring us God's message for today. Blessed morning, church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord again. And uh, greetings. The peace of the Lord be with you during this Lenten season. I trust that you all have been encouraged in your daily devotional reading 
uh, using the land meditations booklet, uh, the, the soft copy. Uh, today's uh, reading is actually on uh, Psalm 95. Yeah? If you have uh, somehow not received the land meditations, please uh, contact your cell group leaders. Your cell group leaders can uh, forward it to you. And, or you can see me afterwards and uh, I'll make it available to you. Right. We still have some days before um, we reached Holy Saturday. <clears throat> All right, today's topic I just put on God's power in transforming lives based on the passage that was read to us. And uh, there's a map there. Paul's uh, second missionary journey. Uh, last week, I, uh, I showed this map. Uh, today, our focus is on uh, the city of uh, Philippi. I just put a, a kind of a oval shape, uh, red color on Philippi. And that's uh, in uh, Macedonia. There's a, a key Roman colony in the Roman Empire, the city of Philippi. And the city was named, if you are if you're interested to know, after Philip II of Macedon and Alexander the Great Father. <clears throat> the first bridgehead in Europe, the first penetration of the gospel in, Europe, in the European continent. The bridgehead is a military term, meaning to cross over a body of waters. It's just like a bridge, you know, crossing over a, a, a body of waters, or you set sail to a place where you want to create that beach head to gain a strategic advantage so as to enter into enemy's territory. That's the bridge head. We will learn what happened in Philippi and thereafter draw some lessons from it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that we can gather as a people of God here. We thank you, Lord, that we can uh, freely worship you today and sing of your power and sing lord of your deliverance and also the, your salvation upon us we really appreciate that you are truly our mighty savior that you are the one who can move mountains any obstacles lord in our lives that we may truly find you as the one who saves us as the one who loves us so today lord as we come together um, to listen to your word. May you give us, Lord, the attentiveness, Lord, that is required to pay attention, Lord, to your word, that we may hear, understand, act upon your word, and be blessed, and others be blessed in and through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, let us quickly uh, look at uh, the three stories that unfolded in the city called uh, Philippi during Paul's second missionary journey. Right? Firstly, the story of Lydia. Uh, she was from a place, a city called Thyatira. That's also mentioned in the book of Revelation, by the way. It is a city located in the northern part of Lydia. Uh, formerly the ancient kingdom uh, called Lydia, before its inclusion uh, into the Roman province of Asia, in the western side of the Aegean Sea. It seems that uh, she, uh, Lydia, a wealthy businesswoman, went to Philippi to sell uh, expensive purple cloth, cloth to the people in Philippi. And uh, she might be known as uh, a lady who came from Lydia in Asia Minor. Hence, we read the name Lydia. It's just like uh, people may know us, oh, okay, and they may not know your name fully. Okay, that man, he, that man we met before, I forgot the name, uh, the man from South Korea, right? And, uh, and, and or that man, a lady from, uh, Peru, Peru, yes, the Peru, something like that, yeah? So Lydia, could be her name, or it could be a lady from Lydia. Anyway, we call her by the name Lydia. Now, on a Sabbath day, 
<clears throat> we don't read of Apostle Paul and his friends went into a synagogue. Because uh, to, have, to have a synagogue form, you need 10 men, heads of household. That's the minimum number to form a synagogue. And if there are no such number of men, uh, then uh, you could form your own kind of prayer meeting uh, in the places that you are, it is comfortable for you. <clears throat> uh, so there was no synagogue because uh, it seemed that the place of Philippi uh, did not have a large Jewish community there. And so Paul and his team went outside the city gate to a river bank, supposing there might be some people uh, meeting there for prayer. That was where Paul met some women, one of whom was Lydia. Uh, she was a worshipper of God, possibly a Gentile God-fearer, and uh, Judaism had appealed to her uh, we can imagine some Jews had in, had an influence on her earlier. And she was found with the women uh, uh, in the riverbank at a place of prayer. It's quite a devout woman, I must say. Now, here's what happened at the riverbank. Paul shared the word. Lydia listened with an open mind. The Lord opened her heart and she accepted the message. And then she and her household were baptized and they became the first recorded converts in Europe. They did not hesitate to be baptized. And I'm going to urge you that if you have not been baptized but you have believed in the Lord Jesus, consider the example of Lydia and her household. More of that later when we come to the jailer. Fast forward to Paul's testimony before King Agrippa. Among other things, Paul said, all those who repent of their sins and turn to God would need to prove they have changed by the good things they do. They need to perform or do the good deeds that befits their repentance, in other words. And one of the good things uh, that Lydia did <clears throat> that gave evidence of her faith in Christ was this. She asked Paul and, he, and his companions to be her guests, saying, if you agree that I am a true believer in the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she urged them until they agreed. Now, she was quite a persistent lady, intentional, but sincere. Hospitality to God's traveling servants was one of the evidence of a faith in Christ. Of course, there are different types of evidence, and even yourself, you would have shown of your love, your faith in Christ Jesus. But hospitality was Lydia's mark of faith. We must move on. On another day, Paul and his friends met a demon-possessed girl, slave girl, as they were going to the place of prayer. This lady, this slave girl, could tell fortune. She made money for her owners, and she followed after Paul and his team, and day after day, kept screaming and shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God. They are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. By way of illustration, the slave girl was like a ventriloquist. A ventriloquist is one who could make the voice appear to come from someone else. Paul did not hesitate. Uh, did, uh, Paul did not need, rather, the help of the evil spirit to publicize his ministry for him through the demon-possessed slave girl. Moreover, the Bible has a number of examples of evil spirits recognizing the identity and the mission of Jesus 
and the source of Jesus' disciples' ministry. But the evil spirit's recognition of these things did not do them any good. They remained as they were, evil spirits. It's like having a head knowledge. But that knowledge of the Lord Jesus did not do them any good. I trust we are not like the evil spirits, right? Having a lot of hate knowledge. But the hate knowledge doesn't impact us at all. It's business as usual. So we must not be like the evil spirits. Paul knew that the evil spirit was not only insincere, but also deceptive in declaring the way of salvation. Because if the evil spirit was really sincere, about people coming to know how to be saved, surely the holy, the, 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 the evil spirit could then freely or voluntarily come out of the slave girl. Isn't it? Instead, the evil spirit kept her in spiritual bondage. But not until Paul got greatly annoyed, or should I say displeased, about the evil spirit's hidden agenda. And Paul said to the evil spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And instantly the evil spirit left the slave girl. Praise the Lord. And the helpless slave girl was delivered through the powerful name of Jesus Christ by whose power and authority, Paul commanded the evil spirit to leave her. Today, there are people who need to be set free from spiritual bondage of evil spirits through the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Yes, we need that. And by the way, the name of that spirit, there's a a, 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 a Greek understanding of that spirit, uh, they call it the Python spirit. Yeah, it's like a Python uh, moving on the belly. And I've talked to a brother before, uh, a few months ago, and, and it happened right in the church where somebody manifested and moved like a snake until, she, until the person was delivered. Yeah, so this was what happened then, and this what happened in my friend's church. We move on to the third story in Philippi, the jailer. The story about the jailer is connected with the owners of the slave girl and Paul and his companions. Now, with the hope of uh, income gone, because the slave girl was, uh, had been delivered, the uh, owners of the slave girl took the law into their own hands. And so they dragged Paul and his friends into the marketplace before the authorities. And soon a mob followed, uh, quickly was formed and followed after them. Right? And you know what mob is, right? These people in uh, Paul's days, they accused them of bringing upon them a new religious faith not authorized by the Roman laws. But this was just uh, merely an excuse because they cared nothing. The owners cared nothing about the religious practices. All they cared about was their loss of wealth or loss of income um, through their exploitation of a demon-possessed girl. And so the owners argued their case before the authorities uh, as Romans, as Roman citizens, but they failed to recognize that Paul and his friends were also Roman citizens. Because later we read the Roman authorities had to apologize to Paul and his friends for they stripped them, they beat them badly and they jailed them without first investigating the accusation brought before them. And what gross injustice isn't it? 
And sometimes we do read of that as well. Gross injustice among some governments or the governing authorities in this world. Now, when Paul and Silas, they, when they were in the, uh, the prison, in the inner cell, they prayed and sang hymns to God. But today, we sing, uh, we sang just now, songs and hymns, but in freedom. But they were doing that in their prison cell. And fellow prisoners listened to them. Then what happened? A big earthquake struck. Deliverance came in a most unexpected way. Who could have ever imagined this? Prison foundations shaken, prison doors opened, prisoners' chains came loose. Prison warden, who initially wanted to take his life thinking the prisoners had escaped, all of a sudden asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? Could the jailer, like the prisoners, have also heard Paul and Silas' prayer and singing hymns to God? And the content of their prayer and the truth of the lyrics now beginning to make sense to them? Could it be like this? Could the jailer have taken notice of Paul and Silas' conduct? calm at peace and godly in response in the midst of adversity unlike other prisoners imagine you and i are in the prison cell not because of the wrong things that you did but because of your faith in christ how would you respond mang chang or praising god and praying to god Praise God that through adversity, the adversity did not prevent God's people, God's servants from praising and worshipping Him. I mean, just like some of us here who have gone through life, challenges in life, right? I mean, there are some who just chose to be far away from God, get so disappointed, even disillusioned with God, and they just go away. But that's, this place is the best place to come in the midst of our adversity or challenges we face. Because this is a place where we can hear God's word to be encouraged in our spirit and so that we may not remain downcast forever. This is a place where we can gather together to still affirm and praise and trust God and sing praises to Him together with God's people. And this is the place we can get mutual encouragement right amen despite all the challenges that we face so what the what the motivating factor might be for paul and silas uh it to take uh, uh, uh rather what the motivating factor might be it took a uh, an earthquake for the jailer to ask the vital question what must i do to be saved that's for the jailer whether they came to know they understood the lyrics or whether they were listening in they saw their conduct or whatever else might be the motivating factor the fact is that they asked that important question and paul and silas told the jailer this believe in the lord jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household that's so important having that confident trust, having that faith in Jesus. Later, when they were in the jailer's house, they shared the word of the Lord with the jailer and all in his household, all of them immediately were baptized. No hesitation, just like Lydia and her household. That's what sometimes people call the believer's baptism. The belief followed by baptism. Don't take too long. I took far too long, seven years, to be baptized because nobody told me of the importance of being baptized 
when I came to know the faith in Jesus Christ. The jailer and everyone were filled with joy of salvation. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The jailer found that joy in that circumstance. In his frightening circumstance, he found salvation. He found joy. Now, what lessons might there be from these three stories? What can we learn from the three stories in Philippi? Conversion of Lydia, the deliverance of the slave girl, and the salvation of jailer. And of course, the jailer's and the Lydia's household. What can we learn from these stories? Pause for a while. I just give us, say, 30 seconds or so to talk to your neighbor or you reflect on your own. What lesson did you gather before I share more with you? Okay, I'll pause for some moment. Okay, enough time. Okay, let me share with you what I gather uh, some lessons. One, expect different responses. Yet all need to hear the gospel. I'll explain that uh, as, I, as I go along. Now, many years ago, some of us uh, heard about type A and type B evangelism. Hands up if you have heard that before. Type A, type B, yes, yeah, there are a few, lah, right? Because we went through the training uh, in, in a, many, a few dec decades ago. Type A evangelism refers to reaching out to people uh, who are generally more receptive to the gospel. All right? Uh, they are ready to be reaped. They are like the uh, low-hanging fruits. They are like people uh, of the Lydia type. Huh? Because Lydia had a spiritual felt need in her heart. Paul spoke words that would have caused faith to arise in her heart and led her into a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's Lydia. So what does it require for us in practical terms to evangelize? Remember the example of Paul and his friends? What ca can we learn from him and his friends in evangelism? Go out from the place of residence because they went out from the place of their lodging in Philippi, right? So we go out from our place of residence, spend time with people as Paul and his friends spend time with the women by the riverside. Engage with them naturally in conversation concerning Jesus. And that's what Paul and Silas did. This is not rocket science, right? These are people who love Jesus and who love others to hear Jesus and be saved. Go out from our place of residence, spend some time with people, engage with them naturally in conversation concerning Jesus. Now, in our conversation, conversation with uh, people, um, if we sense the person may be a seeker, God can give us that discernment. Yeah, all right? If we sense that the person may be a seeker, we can then gently say and inquire at some point in the conversation. Uh, not immediately, but maybe towards the later part of the conversation. He may say something like this, if you sense that he or she is a seeker. Jesus loves you. Would you like to be prayed for, for the things that you have shared with me and receive Jesus into your life in spite of all what they have gone through? Jesus loves you. Would you like to be prayed for and receive Jesus into your life? If the person say yes, joy will surely fill your heart, I'm sure of that. Then lead the person in a short prayer to receive Christ Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior. Doesn't have to be a long prayer, a short prayer. Right? 
At other times, we may come across more challenging kind of people that require this type B evangelism or the type B kind of people. With regard to the slave girl, Paul had to contend with the owners of the slave girl and also the evil spirit that possessed her. However, do not easily quit. Even if we may experience great annoyance or displeasure like Paul. Where sometimes we may evangelize together. We can then share if we do if, if we do that together, we can then share and pray for collective discernment on how to respond to type B person. Now, sometimes I know some of us may be sharing with their uh, non-believing friends or relatives. They share in your cell group. And then you pray for one another. You seek collective discernment on what to do and so on. And uh, we will be mutually helped in our evangelistic endeavor. God willing, we may experience a spiritual breakthrough in cracking the hard nuts through the powerful name of Jesus Christ. The hard nuts to crack is not impossible to crack. In fact, Saul was one of the hardest nuts to crack and he became, he was transformed from being a persecutor to a preacher and a missionary. He was transformed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Right? And so, the first lesson is to expect different responses, yet we need to be mindful that all need to hear the gospel. Right? Difficult people should not be excluded from the opportunity to hear the gospel and experience freedom in Christ. All right? The second lesson is this. It's on the slide there, expect opposition, never give in. Look for bridge hates. Related to the first point, when we share Christ with others, this is the thing that we can expect, opposition. Paul and friends face opposition from the owners of the slave girl. And this reminds me of today's brothel owners, human traffickers, masterminds, labor exploiters, and so on and whatnot who would do everything to prevent the, their liberation, the people who are tricked or trapped into doing all these things, to be prostitutes yeah, and to be in the hands of the human traffickers doing their bidding and to be exploited as laborers in a very uh, inappropriate places, uh, not a good place to work and so on with little pay. Paul and Silas also faced opposition from the evil spirit. Oftentimes, people see things in the physical realm only. But we are a people of God. We can have that spiritual discernment, right? And in Paul's case, we learn of the unseen spiritual realm. The evil spirit keeping the person uh, in, in bondage and engaging in unrighteous or improper practice. So we can have that discernment to discern. Paul and Silas and, and other friends also faced opposition, not only from the evil spirit, but also from the Roman authorities. So just as in Paul's days, there could also be unjust governing authorities in our world, which may even be in cahoot with troublemakers or mobsters to prevent Christians from proclaiming the gospel and propagating their faith as citizens. Why should it be? And it, ha it has happened in our world. Whatever the opposition to the gospel may be, never give in and never give up. Instead, as Bible commentator Ajis, 
uh, Ajit Fernando said, and I want to quote him here, we must be looking for bridge heads in order to penetrate a community with the gospel. And he added saying, often the best way is to find some point of contact with someone in the community we wish to reach. Such, such a point of contact is usually established through common interests, all right? The interest may be related to a felt need that we know Christ can answer. For example, sickness, insecurity, fear, marital or marriage problems. It can also be commonly held religious convictions, uh, which is what Paul looked for when he made contact with a community by attending a place of prayer or a synagogue in other occasions. So look for bridge heads. The second point there. A final vital lesson from these three stories in Philippi is this. Expect the power of God in transforming lives. Paul and his companions were merely servants of God in declaring the gospel to different ones. Ultimately, it is, it is about God and ultimately it is God himself who works in us to transform lives. We can never transform lives. We are merely God's instruments. And there is power in the gospel to transform lives. And we just sung one of the songs about the power of God, isn't it? And Paul said in the scriptures, in Romans 1, 16, these words, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Greek. We can never un underestimate the power of the God, power of God, the power of the gospel in transforming lives. And the gospel is unstoppable. Amen. We have heard so much about the stories in the Bible. Of course, some of us may say, you know, hey, what about today? You know, I mentioned a few things about uh, today, right? Well, my friend in the church, and you see the manifestation that was in our lifetime, in our times. I want to share a story in our times. I was at the Prayer United uh, Leaders Annual Retreat last month. I mentioned that in my previous sermon. I heard Reverend Ivor Lim. Um, he, 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 he was the uh, prayer retreat chairman, and I worked with him. And uh, he was given the slot, and I was uh, chairing that session, like an MC. Lah. So I heard Reverend Ivor's testimony, which I would like to share with you as we close on the note of the power of God in transforming lives. And here's a story in our times. And let me quote Reverend Ivo. We, are, we were also in uh, communication uh, through WhatsApp. So under the tree, on the hilltop, we, the students, prayed after we studied in school library at about 10 p.m. Take notice eh? <laughs> at what time they prayed. And where did they pray? Under the tree. And that was the tree, the big tree. Then in the backstage of the school hall, we came together to share and pray each morning. And so there is the school hall there. And then uh, and behind the, the, the school hall, the stage, behind there, uh, there's a curtain, right? Behind there, uh, they they came together to share and pray each morning. And so they prayed, the students prayed at night, the students prayed in the morning. And we started with two or three 
of us. Just that only. Huh? Two or three. Our prayers, he said, were simple. Five minute prayers, then reading the word of God and praying in accordance with the word of God. But the Lord saw our simplicity, sincerity, and faith. Through the sharing of the gospel, and now they began to share the gospel with their friends, huh? and the move, and, the, and should we say, the power of the Holy Spirit, 20 students in my class, in Reverend Ivor's class, came to know the Lord. Praise the Lord, huh? It spread to other classes, first to lower forms, then to form six class. All in all, over a hundred students came to know the Lord, probably more. And this is just a conservative estimate. As I mentioned, I was the MC for that session when Reverend Ivor shared. And after he shared his testimony, I went up on stage. I just couldn't resist asking over 200 participants present on how many of them, how many of us, came to know Christ in our youth. And guess what? About 70% of the hands went up. And we get a message. There's such a great opportunity, Harvestville, among the youth. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. Reach out. To, our fellow, to your peers, if you are youth. Today's message on God's power in transforming lives is for all of us, not just for the young people, but for the middle aged and for the seniors. And I quickly, I want to have go through these lessons again from the conversion of Lydia, deliverance of the slave girl and salvation of the jailer. Expect different responses when sharing Jesus with others. Praise God for the receptive ones, but don't overlook the type B or difficult people. As the song lyrics say, and we sung it just now as well, everyone needs compassion. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a savior. Expect opposition. Never give in, never give up. Paul and his friends didn't. Jesus didn't we shouldn't. Instead, look for bridgeheads in order to penetrate the community with the gospel. The student community, just like Reverend Ivor when he was a student, the students, two or three only, penetrated the student community until over 100 people or students came to know Christ. Look for bridgeheads in order to penetrate the community with the gospel. Student community, workplace community, neighborhood community, wherever the Holy Spirit directs or leads you to. Expect the power of God in transforming lives. We are dealing with the gospel and there is power in the gospel in transforming lives. Lydia, slave girl, jailer, all their lives were transformed by the power of the gospel by the message of our Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, Lydia and Jailer's households were saved as well. 100 students, probably more, as I mentioned just now, in St. Thomas Secondary School in Kuching, came to know Christ as the personal Lord and Savior. And praise God, three saved souls in Subang Methodist Church in the past four months. They came to Christ right in this place, this physical premise. You did not see it, but it happened in this place. Amen. Let us pray. In your own space, in your own quietness, you may respond to God in prayer as you have heard the Lord's word, the stories from the Bible, or even the story in our lifetime today.
Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the prayers of your people. May you hear, Lord, the prayers of your people, their praises, their desires. Hear their prayers, O God. Hear my prayer, O God. Father in heaven, I just want to pray, Lord, put more of your love, Lord. Fill more of our hearts with the love of Jesus. Fill our minds, Lord, with your thoughts of the power of the gospel. Help us, Lord, not to limit you in any way. I want to pray, Lord, for us that you open the door for us for the word. I want to pray, Lord, for bonus for us in sharing the love of Christ with others. I want to pray, God, that more and more people will come into a relationship with you. So open the door for us to go out, Lord, from our place of residence to spend time with people. To inquire, Lord, of them and to pray for them. Grant us this open door because you love, Lord, these people. Father in heaven, we want to praise you for all the stories that we have heard of all the people who have come to know Christ in the days of Paul and in our lifetime and in our church as well. We give you praise and honor to our Lord Jesus Christ and all God's people say, Amen.